So E3D have released Revo, their new hot end system with lots of new features, but how does it compare in terms of flow rate when we compare it to the older V6 style hot end? Well, there's only one way to find out. Brute Forsyth, my extrusion force testing machine. Today's video is sponsored by Oozenest. Oozenest have a broad range of popular, glamorous and engineering materials for 3D printing, including PETG, Glitz PLA, Nylon, Polycarbonate and many more, plus an amazing selection of colours, probably the broadest range of ABS colours available on the market. All their spools are also made entirely of recyclable cardboard, so you can shop without the guilt of disposable plastic spools. If you're looking to stylize your Voron, Ratrig or other 3D printer, check out their materials in the link in the video description. So this here is Brute Forsyth, my extrusion force testing machine. The way it works is the extruder forces filament into the hot end that applies force to the hot end, which is measured by a load cell behind it. It measures lots of data every second, and from that information we can determine how much force over periods of time is required to push filament through that hot end. And from that we can then work out which one is best optimised for higher flow rates, aka faster printing speed. While the first time using the machine was very good and it provided a lot of information, I did feel there were little things that could have been improved. So let me just run you through those opportunities for improvement and what I've done to make improvements. Firstly, running the machine requires G-code. After all, it's basically a 3D printer that only extrudes. Unfortunately, that requires manually writing G-code because slices don't really generate this kind of thing. That took a little while, so I've created a little piece of software to help me do that automatically. It just means I can create various different tests in shorter periods of time. I also found it quite difficult to know at what point we were in the test while running the test. If it takes like an hour to do, and I generally don't time it and I'm not exactly sure how long it takes, I don't know how long is left and all this kind of stuff. I also had no idea what the actual forces were during the test, I just looked at it afterwards. So I learnt a little bit of node red and I've now created this little interface and a better method for logging the data during the testing. It's vastly improved, I think. The next thing was the load cell. In the last test that we did, we were getting almost to three or four kilos of extrusion force, and the load cell was only rated for five kilos. So instead of pushing one load cell to its absolute maximum, I figured we'd upgrade it to a 10 kilogram load cell, which seems a little bit more appropriate, and for then we have, when we have extruders that can apply more force, we shouldn't over, go over the limits too soon, We'll find out. Alongside the change of load cell, I also changed the calibration weight. Because you have to calibrate the load cell so it knows how much deformation translates to how much force, you need a weight of a known value in order to do that. Previously, I used, I think it was a five or 50 gram weight, which is pretty low and pretty small in comparison to the forces that I'm measuring. So that was potentially a source of error as we're up to maybe three or four kilos. So now I have a 500 gram calibration weight. Now, this is still not two or three kilos, but it should be much closer and provide less error compared to what I had previously. I also had to deal with the load cell being sensitive to temperature. Obviously, having a hot end next to something that's sensitive to temperature can be problematic. Just cooling the cold end and having that hot air or warm air blowing near the load cell will cause it to change reading. So I have added a cooling fan to the load cell and redirected the hot air away from the load cell so it shouldn't be heated up as much as it was previously. The last thing I've done is measure the heating output. Now this is measured over PWM, so it's just a series of ones and zeros. And I've just basically reading that straight to the Arduino as a set of ones and zeros. And now we know when the heater is on and when the heater is off. That's gonna be all the upgrades for this testing today, but there will be more coming as we go along. So for the test setup, we've got Oosnest PLA, the same blue material that we used last time. The extruder is a clone dual drive extruder. We're gonna have 40 watt heaters on both hot ends, 0.4 millimeter brass nozzle on both hot ends, silicon socks fitted on both hot ends, and they're each gonna use, well, a thermistor from E3D. This will use the standard V6 cartridge thermistor, and this will obviously use the standard Revo, which is all kind of built in. Heater, thermistor, block, all in one thing. This will use the standard 40 watt from E3D. 24 volt system, I think that's all you need to know. For the test procedure itself, in all the G-code, the motor this time is never gonna be turning off, so that's gonna remain on the entire testing time. 
we're going to be doing temperatures from 180 to 260 degrees Celsius in 10 degrees Celsius increments. The flow rates is going to be 1 to 15 cubic millimeters per second in 2 millimeter cube per second jump. Extrusion test itself will be for 15 seconds with a 4 second gap in between the tests. Each test will be re repeated 4 times, one after the other. So in total, 288 tests for hot end and over half a million data points. That's a lot of data. So let's look at the results. You're going to love this. <laughs> So the first set of results to look at is heater power, which is totally new and super interesting. Here we're looking at the 3 cubic millimeter per second and 15 cubic millimeter per second at 220 degrees Celsius for the Revo 6. Both flow rates seem to start around the same power for the, like, the first few seconds of the test, 28 to 32% ish. But after maybe two and a half seconds, the high flow rate test seems to have a significant increase in power to then settle around 45 to 50% for the rest of the test, while the low flow rate settles in after increasing at around 30 to 35%. This delay in response between when the extrusion started and when the PID system responded was very consistent for all of the tests. If you just put them all on top of each other, you can see they're all like the same at the start, and then after like two and a bit seconds, they change into whatever they need to be for the remaining 12, 13 seconds until the end of the test. So why is there a delay between when the extruder starts and when the heater turns on or turns on more to cope with that filament? It's because the PID system is based on temperature alone. So as the cold filament enters the heater block or hot end nozzle area, thermal energy is transferred from that area into the cold filament. That will then cause a, change, a small change in temperature of that heater block. But the heater will only turn on when that change is sufficient to, for the PID system to sense that it needs to turn on. A small change in temperature won't instantly cause it to turn on. So it does just take that amount of time for the filament to come through, cool the hot end enough that the heater needs to turn on. And then obviously at that point the PID system is responding to constant drops in temperature and it increases the heat power respectively to ensure that the temperature doesn't actually drop. So let's now compare the Revo data to that of the V6. And the first thing I think you can see is that the data just looks less spiky. Bit of a weird way to describe it, but with the Revo, it looks like it's going up and down quite significantly, quite regularly. Whereas the Revo, it does still have those spikes, but it seems to take a little bit longer to get there. I think what we're seeing here is the trade-off between stability and responsiveness. The Revo seems to be designed to be a very quickly responding system. We've seen this with how quickly it heats up, for example. And the V6, on the other hand, is set to be more stable. So it takes more energy to change it, but it also stays at a similar temperature more consistently. What we also notice, though, is that the response time is much slower with the V6. So it's taking maybe four to five seconds for the heater to start responding to the start of the extrusion. And it takes a further sort of eight seconds up to maybe around the 11 or 12 second period before it's even at that kind of stable point where it stays the same for the rest of the test. So it's like most of the way through the test before the PID system has actually caught up to what it should be doing. Another thing that could be impacting our readings here though is the position of the thermistor. With the V6, we have this set thermistor position in the block but adjacent to the nozzle, a fair bit away from the heater. Whereas on the Revo design, it's all integrated and very much closer to one another. So maybe we're just reading more precisely what the real temperature is on the Revo, whereas with the V6, is there's definitely some disparity there. So let's start to take a look at some averages now for the heater power, starting with the Revo. Firstly, we can see that in general, as temperature increases, so does the heater power, which makes sense. A higher temperature involves some slightly larger losses, so it needs a little bit more power to be able to deal with that. Looking at the V6 results, we can see that in general, the shape is the same. More power, more heat. But let's take a slightly closer look and try and determine how much power is needed for the temperature and how much power is needed for increased flow rate. These are quite small changes in power, but that's what we'd expect because this is not changes with flow rate. This is only changes with temperature. So this is just the additional loss of power you have when you're at a higher temperature. Things change quite dramatically when we start to look at flow rate though. 
In both instances, it looks like the V6 is more efficient in that it's using less power to deliver what is seemingly the same job. But it could also be that the Revo is more efficient at transferring thermal energy into the filament, which means the power usage in total will be higher because for each unit of filament that comes out, it's absorbed more energy. Maybe a difference in internal, internal geometry in the nozzle would result in that increased thermal energy transfer and thus more power being used. One thing we can say though, is that the output power of these heater cartridges does seem to be easily sufficient for what we're delivering here. It seems like we're only using 20 to 25 watts. So while reducing the overall power would maybe slightly reduce or increase your heat up times at the start of the print, it shouldn't seemingly impact the overall or peak performance of the hot end during the main printing stage. So that's it for the power requirements. What about force? Which hot end requires more or less force to deliver more or less flow rate? Firstly then, for those that have not seen extrusion force data previously, this is generally what it looks like. I typically plot time along the x-axis and force along the y-axis, and then each line is a different flow rate. If it's smooth and consistent, like this one here, it's a pretty good indication that the flow is fine. However, if it's starting to fluctuate significantly, then that probably suggests that something is not quite right. Typically, the gear's slipping on the filament. So you can see on this graph where the gear teeth are slipping on the filament. But the thing is, if it's caused by force limits alone, like force being the only factor, then surely it would always happen at the same force. Like if, it, if an extruder can only push with three kilograms, it would kind of slip every time it gets to three kilograms. If it can slip at forces at half of its actual limit, then there must be something else impacting that. I have some suspicions about what this could be, but at the moment I'm not entirely sure and I think it needs a little bit more data. That's gonna be something we're gonna study at another time, but if you have any thoughts or suggestions on what that could be, feel free to leave them down in the comments section. As you can see from this data though, it does share many characteristics that we saw in the previous video. So a sharp starting peak, which we now know is not due to the motor turning on, pre-molten filament segment where the four seconds before a test everything, all the filament in the hot end has kind of fully melted, and some drops in force where the filament seems to be slipping on the gears. So let's summarize all my force data for both of these hot ends into a couple of graphs so we can look at comparing. For the Revo, we can see at 15 cubic millimeters per second, specifically at 180 degrees Celsius, the average force just doesn't look quite right there. It looks like it's dropped, and this suggests that the extruder itself is reaching its maximum extrusion force and is having to drop as the teeth skip. So as that drops, if you have too many drops, then obviously average is somewhere between the maximum and where it drops to, rather than the actual peak. If we look at the V6, we can immediately see, without doing any specific analysis, that there seem to be far greater negative effects on the 15 cubic millimeter per second and 13 cubic millimeter per second flow rates because the data is just significantly less consistent, which means the forces are fluctuating more. If we compare the average force required for the Revo to the average force compared to the V6, we can see that in nearly every situation, the Revo requires less force than the V6. On average, in fact, the Revo can achieve the same flow rate with 15% less force than the V6. It's all very well knowing that one hot end requires less force than the other for the same amount of flow, but that's not really what we want, is it? We want to know how much faster we can push for the same amount of force, which is a bit of a different question and turns out kind of difficult to calculate, but I think I've managed it and this is what I found. Immediately, you can see there's quite a significant range for example, at 180 and 190 degrees Celsius, the V6 seems to perform at maybe 20% better than the Revo, while at 200 degrees onwards, it's quite a significant improvement for the Revo. Considering we're printing PLA here, and typically nowadays we're printing between 210 and 220 degrees Celsius, it looks like we're going to get about 50 to 60% extra flow rate on the Revo compared to the V6. So that's it for today. In the next video, I'm gonna take a look at the ripples in the graphs because there seem to be some, like very periodic ripples and not sure where they're coming from. So let's do a bit of investigation to try and find out.
Before we finish, I also need to disclose that while this video is not sponsored by E3D, they did provide the hot ends, the Revo Micro and Revo 6, as part of the agreement that we had for TCT Show back last year when they were announced. And there's also going to be an affiliate link down below if you do want to purchase them. So that's it for me today. Thank you very much for watching. Hopefully this has been useful. Signing off from Brute Force Earth and I, we'll see you in the next one. Well, there's only one way to find out. We stick it in Brute Foresight. Oh, that sounds weird. <laughs> oh dear God.